In this video, we'll be covering the randomize node effect. And of all of these ones that we've been covering recently, this is going to be the easiest to understand. The only unique aspects really are gonna be in this pitch tab, and then just kind of keeping in mind your starting position for some of these other ones and whether or not it's gonna be bipolar or not. And then that would dictate where you kind of wanna start that parameter um, in order to get the max benefit out of the randomization. You'll notice when I click, we have nothing in the inspector. So let's just go ahead and uh, let's get some notes in here. I'm just gonna hit the C3 over and over. Okay, there we go. So that's what we're gonna work with here. And let me just double check. That's actually C2. Let's bring that up to C3. All right, now the first thing we can do is we can randomize pitch. Now normally, the way you would do this at the note level in Bitwig would be to go to the expressions, go to pitch, and introduce some chaos. And then let's go over to that pitch tab, and we can see how it's being offset. Now you'll notice that the note itself is not moving, so the semitones is being accounted for here in pitch. And if I was to add on an instrument track and record the output from the polymer, it's going to do that same thing. It's giving us that identical position, but it's not actually changing the note, which is kind of annoying because if we are trying to get some kind of a happy accident via randomizing the notes, this isn't going to work for us because how do we kind of fine tune that? How do we quantize it? All of those sorts of concerns. Now, what we can do instead, and I just want to go back in here and just cancel that out is I can use the randomize and I can use the pitch and I can take advantage of the quantize as well. So bipolar, again, we were hitting that C3 key. Let's say that we want it to be able to go up and down one octave. We'll go up to 12, we'll turn the randomize quantize on and let's see the result that we get this time. All right, nice. So I go back in there, we can see how much it's changed, but we can also see that all of these notes are going to not have any variance here at that pitch level. It's actually moved the semitones around, which is great because now we can play with these notes, we can move them around, we can get a result we like, we can bring that up onto our actual track. And it's like a very quick way of like generating some unique melodies or unique bass lines if you wanna you know, do that if you get stuck in some kind of a writer's block situation. Now, if for some reason I wanted to allow this to go off of that, like, <laughs> quantized value, I could do something unique like this. And let's just watch and now see the result that we get. And I'm hopeful that this will actually go outside of that range. Did it do it? Or did it keep everything in this time? Yeah, it kept everything in this time, but it is possible in this case for it to actually go and extend all the way down to like the B here. Um, or it could even extend and go up to the C sharp. Oh, it did. It did go up to the C sharp here. Okay, cool. Um, and then you'll also notice when I highlight over that we get some additional variance there from the pitch. So things are kind of all over the place if that's what you're going for. I doubt that will be what you're going for, but it is it is possible. It is an option um, if you're doing some more experimental stuff with, with tonality, I should say. All right, let's just bring that back to 12. Let's add the quantize back on. And one thing you could also do is, and I always forget what this one is called, key filter took me way longer than I want to admit to find that I was looking for something that said constrain. But what I could do now is if we started in the middle and we started on our root note like a C, we could do like C major for this. And we know that then it should only come out onto white notes and we have the option to either constrain or filter. So in our example here, maybe we already have a rhythm that we like, like this rhythm, and then we can constrain. And let's just watch and see the result. Mm -hmm. 
And when we go and look at this, we should only be seeing white notes being hit. And then if we want to go further and move some things around, we could. So again, it's just a way of kind of triggering some quick inspiration. If, for example, you just had like a row of C's on like 16th notes, which, which wouldn't be a bad idea for something like this, and then chose filter, it's going to not play. It's, it's going, I shouldn't say play, it's going to not trigger a note that falls outside of that C major key. Okay, and that time it actually played almost everything. Let's do that again. Let's see if this time we get fewer. Yeah, okay, that's sort of what I was expecting to see. So that's the way that you work with pitch. Very straightforward. We'll have a couple other examples of that in just a little bit when we go into the manual. I didn't say this at the beginning, probably self-explanatory, but you turn these on and off by clicking. Um, on the names. So let's move on now to velocity. And for things like velocity and pressure, very important to remember that like those are not bipolar things that you can play in. Like you can't play a negative velocity. And so when we're using this one or we're using pressure, it's important that we know what's going to happen based on the parameter that that is routed to. So I want to go in here first, and I'm going to go into the expressions, and I'm going to take velocity, and you can see that there's already a lot of variance in that. And let's go ahead and let's like set them all to the same thing, and we're going to set it to 100, okay, like 100%. Now, remember, velocity can only go, like, up. So if these are all set at 100, even if I set kind of like a very high percentage amount, the vast majority, or I shouldn't say the vast majority, but a lot of them are still just going to be pinned at that 100 setting. So if we route velocity to something like fold, and remember, this can only go up. We're never going to see it go down. We'll watch and see the end result here of what comes out. And this is, again, just one of these things that's easier shown than like trying to talk through. Okay. Now let's go and let's look at the variation this time. And you can see that most of them stayed pinned to the top. So the way that this is going to be almost like most effective would be more so to go in here take all of these, bring our velocity down closer to something like 50. And, and you don't have to do it this way, right? Like maybe this is the sort of variance that you want, very minimal um, like that. But now I could go in here and, yeah, let's put the velocity to something like 80%. And we're going to see like a very big range. And in my case here, I'm going to bring this down much lower. And let's watch and see. Cool. And yeah, you can see what's now happened. Now it's like really, really extreme. So this is this is why it's good to sometimes go through and watch a video like this, because it's putting this into perspective for you of how extreme this is going to be. So let's yeah, let's maybe just bring that closer to something like 24%. And that's going to be more of a result like what I would want for randomization coming out of velocity. Now, what's different between velocity and something like timbre? Timbre is like a unique bitwig thing. And this is like bipolar by default. So now I would want to make sure I have my fold value, for example, up somewhere like this because we're going to see it jumping to the right and to the left. If I put this down to zero, there's going to be so many situations where even though the timbre amount is being varied, the actual sonic result is not. And that's what you just have to kind of watch out for with this one. So I'm going to bring this just to like 12. I mean, who cares? This is just an example, right? And we're going to route the timbre in here. And we're going to clear out the velocity. And let's watch and see what happens first. And nothing because timbre's not turned on. There you go. Now we're starting to see some variation on both sides. And I can kind of preview and figure out where that right place is. So very different to what we were just seeing with velocity. Give it a little more. And that right there might be perfect to really get some extremes on this knob. All right. And then let's see the result that we get. 
And that wasn't really a great result that spat out of it. And again, it is random every time. So you always want to be recording this to get the take that you like, and then you can go in and modify. So there we can see what we've got with timbre. And again, we can always go in here and jump in and introduce more chaos or work with the spread, which is going to then kind of change the value um, a little bit every time it plays back through. But we don't need to, to cover that here. But yeah, I could bring these all back introduce some chaos, bring the mean closer to like zero, add more chaos, and do something like that. So again, you have that option for all of these things if you record the result to go back in and modify. So I'm not going to cover pressure because pressure is going to work basically identical to velocity. It's just another like control, you know. So for example, um, in our case, it's like the aftertouch. Let me just clear that out. Just, just bring that up there. I can't play a negative pressure. So in our case here, it would be fine to set that all the way down, bring this all the way up, bring our pressure value kind of all the way up in terms of randomness. And yeah, if I go here... Again, we're never going to see it go backwards. Now, it might still sometimes generate something that's down there, but that's the way that that one would work. It's, it's, it's an awkward one to show, like, because I'm playing, sometimes accidentally hitting the aftertouch. But if you're really trying to go for extreme variation on the sound, you could route some of these things to, like, filter cutoff, some of these things to the sub amount, um, some of these things to the skew, or if you were using a different one or you had effects. Again, like, that's not the point of this video necessarily, but it, it should be pretty clear how you could take this to a real extreme um, if you were combining all of these things. Okay, we have pan and we have gain. These ones are straightforward. Again, when you record the end result, you will see what happens. So I will just bring... The pan up and I'm not routing pan to anything it is just going to move each of these notes around the stereo field and I'll just show you where you go there it is and then the same thing can be done with gain and again gain I believe is probably relative to voice level on this one I don't know that for a fact, but if you have like the volume or something cranked all the way up, I'm not sure how much more variation you're going to get. But gain, again, can be a um, bipolar sort of control, and we'll see that. But if somebody knows exactly what that is like routed to, that would be useful to know. All right, so there you go with the gain, and you can see that it's this expression right here that you're playing with. All right, so that in essence is the randomize. Not a whole lot else to it, not a whole lot else that needs to be covered with it, but let's go into the manual and just read their examples, their use cases. And most of them are gonna be involving the pitch, which to me is again, the most interesting and unique part of this randomized device. Probably the only time I'd really be bringing it in. Okay, so what we are going to see with the manual in a lot of cases is where it says mapped around the current value. That's kind of the important part, and that was what I was trying to show you with pressure and velocity and pan and all of that. But when we get into the useful for, the first example, turning any note clip into an anti-loop with different parameters with each note that plays, that is doing the thing where you would go to extreme settings. And if we had like a bunch of different effects on here, we could route timbre and pressure and velocity to w a lots of different things and also pitch. And you could just create a really wild anti-loop with no logic to it whatsoever by doing that. I'm not going to show that here, but it'd be pretty easy to set up if you wanted to. The next example, giving individual pan positions to each note of a chord or arpeggio. This one's kind of cool. I, I could see why people would do this. Like I'm going to bring this down a lot lower, but and I don't know what I still have set there. Pressure. Okay. Okay, and that's just too subtle for the example. So you can hear that each time, each note, 
is getting put into a different pan position. And you could then, of course, go in and modify the end result if you recorded it. Creating tiny pitch instability to the original notes or a second instrument layer for analog drift. So a way of mimicking the analog drift thing would be to go in here and plus or minus would be fine. We don't want quantize turned on, but we do want to bring this down to just a very, very small amount. And let's play a chord. And actually, for this example, I'll set it up to something that's going to make it sound quite dissonant. And you can hear what's happening sometimes with the randomness that's being generated. But it's a very quick and easy way to, like it said, kind of in introduce some analog drift. And for this sound, it's not great but same every time and varying up a little bit um let's see what else we have adding additional timbre and pressure variety to any mpe friendly sound like the bitwig ones um, don't need to show that that's straightforward that was basically what we were just doing shifting drum notes to sometimes trigger different drum elements this one's kind of a cool idea so so what you can do is basically mimic like a round robin kind of thing. So let's grab like a drum machine. And I would love to find a preset that just has like all very similar sounds. Maybe something like this with toms. Let's take a listen. Sure, let's just go ahead and use this one. And I'm not going to get the full range in here, but it would be easy to determine that. Uh, so let's go randomize. And we're just going to do it for like one octave. We don't want it to be bipolar because we're just always going to play the final one. And we can already see it's doing what we want it to do. So we'll bring this up an octave. And I know we can go more than that because there's more... Uh, triggers on here but basically now i could just play the same note over and over again have a really cool rhythm going and then have this trigger different sounds without having to worry about hitting those different sounds so i'm just playing the c the c1 or c2 key over and over here And that's the way you could do that, which I think is cool. Again, for Round Robin, if you had a bunch of hi-hats that you liked that were all just like maybe a tiny, tiny bit different from a recording, and you had those in a drum machine, you could introduce a little bit of like organic variation there um, and do it really fast and really easily. And that's going to do it for us talking about the uh, randomized note effect. Um, if you're a Bitwig producer and you use this thing all the time or you use it in different ways, please do share that down in the comments. Otherwise, I hope everybody has uh, an amazing day and I will talk to you soon. Take care.